Thank you, Kaylee, for the introduction and for the hospitality that you've shown me in the uh, last week. I came up last Thursday with my telephone and took the images, most of the images that you'll see uh, this morning on the screen. I looked for images on the internet and, and found some, but uh, the best method that I found was to take the photographs and then upload them to my computer. And I, I didn't enhance them, but I was able to really go close in and look at some of the images. And so when you do go to the collection, just you can get right up close and see uh, some of the things you'll see in here. Maybe you'll find some things I did not see. Uh, when Kaylee contacted me uh, last year to speak to Dali in La Mancha, I was uh, uh, surprised to learn that Salvador Dali had illustrated so many different books, one of them being the 1957 version or edition, the French edition of Don Quixote, and uh, also Alice in Wonderland and uh, Dante and the Bible, the Holy Bible. So I, I was uh, a little afraid that you know what I'd find would not be uh, suitable for a public talk. And I thought, oh, what has Dali done to Don Quixote? I was very intrigued to learn that uh, you know the images, some are true to what you would expect to see. Maybe you form those same images in your mind, but I was intrigued to see how Dali with his unique blend of the of realism and surrealism, how he would portray our beloved Don Quixote. So uh, a disclaimer, I am not an art historian. In fact, when Kaylee and I spoke, she said she wanted a non-expert in the field. And I thought, oh, I'm a non-expert, but I'm here to talk to you about art. Uh, but I, I have read uh, the Quixote and studied it for many years. And, uh, and uh, I think that that uh, perspective will bring a, a different look at some of these images that you'll see today. So what do we find when we look at Dali's representation of the Quixote? This, uh, rather, let me go back to this first image titled The Golden Age. Perhaps this is the most realistic of the images that you'll see. You see a Don Quixote uh, sitting on a hill with his lance, and he's holding up the acorn, which uh, has reminded him of the golden age of man when the earth was uh, providing all that man needed, and all you had to do is just literally pick up the, the acorns and, and eat of the earth without a lot of work. And so he is with some goat herds and they've given him acorns to eat and he's, oh, he's going to have a long harangue uh, about the golden age. And so that's uh, where the image of the acorn is, uh, is from. And listen to uh, the description, which is in the very first page of the first chapter of part one. And you'll see that the image here tends to match what one would expect. And so this is one of Cervantes' narrators, and he's describing a man whose name is perhaps Alonso Quijana, or maybe Alonso Quesada, or maybe Alonso Quijada. So even the narrator can't pinpoint exactly who this guy is, but he's certainly some man whose name starts with a k sound. So here we go, and I'm reading. Uh, from the first page of Don Quixote. At a village of La Mancha, whose name I do not wish to remember, there lived a little while ago one of those gentlemen who are wont to keep a lance in the rack, an old buckler, a lean horse, and a swift greyhound. Our gentleman was about 50 years of age, of a sturdy constitution, but wizened and gaunt. So that matches what I thought perhaps Don Quixote would look like, or maybe I've seen other illustrators and sort of falls into line here. So it made me think, you know, what is the function of an illustrator of a book? Uh, an illustrator isn't exactly the same as, you know, an artist who is going to paint a, an enormous masterpiece that'll hang 
on the walls of El Prado in, in Madrid, but rather it'll be in a, in a small book. And should he be faithful to the text, or should he or she go off script? And so here I think that this is a, a faithful rendition of uh, the intended physical description of Cervantes. And that's, of course, just you know, thinking, well, if, if it, to me, it, it seems to match up. Uh, and other illustrators have done this, but as you'll see in a moment, Dali is going to, going to go off script. Uh, in the second scene, if you'll note the image of the hand outstretched with the acorn, and then look at one of the smaller images that you'll see off to the side of the main image, separated here by the lance and, and this uh, area, which someone pointed out to me earlier, probably poppies. And uh, you'll see that there's a clear division between the realistic La Mancha, and then we get into Dali's La Mancha, and it turns into this uh, image of a lost Eden. And you'll see perhaps an Eve figure offering up in that same gesture as Don Quixote lauds the acorn, this uh, forbidden fruit of Eden. And then these images here, let me read to you a little bit more from uh, the first part of Don Quixote. And this comes from his Golden Age speech. In that age, in that holy age, all things were common, and to provide his daily sustenance, all a man needed to do was lift up his hand and pluck the food from the sturdy oaks that generously invited him to gather their sweet, ripe fruit. Knowing Dali and his tendencies, one might think that these scantily clad figures are a figment of his 20th century imagination, but further on in the Golden Age speech, Cervantes writes, or rather, Don Quixote writes, or speaks, uh, then did the innocent and beauteous maidens trip from dale to dale and hill to hill with braided locks or flowing tresses. They were decked in some green dock leaves interwoven with ivy. And so uh, I do think that this particular lithograph of Dali is a faithful representation of the uh, text itself. But what would you say about this particular image? So who is this image meant to be? And I've read the Quixote several times, and I've never seen Don Quixote with his head exploding. As you go through the lithograph collection, you'll learn that the technique that Dali used to create these types of ink spots uh, were varied. He might have taken an egg filled with ink and just threw it against the stone to make this image. Or perhaps uh, the ink pellets would be fired from a gun. And so he used the accidental to create the intentional. And as I was looking at many of these lithographs, I thought, well, did the idea to show Don Quixote, our beloved Don Quixote, you know, this uh, classical figure here uh, in his fine clothing, speaking to the golden age, the classical golden age, and here he is with his head exploded. Uh, did the idea come first to show the literal representation of the madness that uh, propels uh, Alonso Quijano or Quesada or Quesada into La Mancha to have these adventures? Or did he look at the ink blot and say, that's, that's the image I need to denote madness? And so as we look at these slides, you'll see a lot of these explosions of color. And you see this uh, to a certain extent with uh, these images that are probably poppies. So with this image, we do have a, a surrealistic turn. However, in the background, can you spot an image from La Mancha that's uh, realistic? The windmill. And so here we have that characteristic, unique quality of Dali 
the mixing of the classical realistic that, that shows a, uh, a superb hand in, in uh, terms of detail. If you look at the hand from this other slide, it's, it's really quite magnificent, the shading and the detail. And of course, that's mixed in with the bizarre, juxtaposed, surreal images. This next slide, or this next image, is called the visions. Now, I'll give you a second to look at it. There's a lot going on here. I think I've spent quite a while staring at this image. And the longer you stare, the more will come to you. You can see the ink explosion. And perhaps another one here that's a little more controlled, sort of beginning to spiral. The spiral is an image that repeats through the collection that's here at the museum. So what are some of the images from the Quixote that you can decipher? And that's what we're doing, is we're looking at one image, but coming up with multiple interpretations just laid on top, one on, on top of the other. And it's a little hard to see uh, with, here's a closer image here. Now you can discern a little better some of the, well, the feature of the bird. This is not a pleasant bird figure. This is an evil bird. This is going to tear you to shreds. Uh, after the figure with the sword uh, stabbing your shield, your buckler that has an eye in the middle, uh, after that figure gets you, the, the bird's going to take you out as well. And then, uh, do you see who this is? Or So the main characters of the Quixote are Don Quixote and his sidekick, Sancho Panza, and then his... <laughs> I, do you remember his horse's name? Rocinante. Rocinante. And so if you look carefully, here's Rocinante. And the serpent is at his neck. So this is not a, a pleasant image. This is, this is a vision not of Madonna and child or of angels. This is, this is terror. This is fear. This is pain. And if, if the images surrounding this ink blot don't suggest that, then the ink blot does. And so the collection is quite dark. And to me, that's at the core of Don Quixote. It's, it's a, a story, it's over a thousand pages and in length, and it's, it's funny. But at its core, it's really not funny. It's, it's about an older man who's lost his wits, and he's off in the wilderness messing around and getting into trouble. And, uh, but he is in some psychic pain. Oh, yes. Uh, this uh, image here, as I stared at this image, I realized that what's happening in this picture is as if it were happening from the bottom of a well or a cave. And so someone is down there looking out to salvation so high above. And the salvation piece, the dove, I'd like to be able to interlay some Christian or religious symbolism on these images. I haven't found much other than the images that you'll see of the Quixote with his hands outraised, perhaps in, an, in, a, in a posture of the crucified Christ. Uh, so uh, we could perhaps lay that interpretation on top of it. Uh, and I, I didn't and when I was looking at this, but someone else may interpret it in, in that way. The uh, image at the bottom right, I believe, is Sancho Panza, who's watching on helpless. And as I studied the lithograph outside, I saw this in the swirling upper right center. Do you see what I see? It's a skull. And I'm, I wonder, was that intentional? Probably. I, it would be uncanny if it weren't. So that, uh, that image, uh, the visions. This next one gives us a break. Less in your face, but it's the same type of idea. 
It's titled Reverie of Don Quixote in the Night. And he is surrounded by his books, and he's reading. And so he's in his um, literary world. He's uh, beginning that descent into madness. And you have these images up in the, the ceiling area of his room that, uh, that symbolize this. So taking a look at this image, may recall for you if you have seen the uh, series of uh, lithographs by Francisco Goya at the end, uh, actually the beginning of the 19th century, 1799, uh, the Caprichos series shows a man at uh, asleep at his desk. And um, the Spanish title of this is El Sueño de la Razón produce monstruos. So it's the sleep of reason produces monsters. And that's what a lot of these images have in common is the idea of the monster, the thing that's at the bottom of the cave, the thing that won't let you get to or out to salvation, to heaven. The um, images here are uh, animal images as well. There are some birds, some bat, an owl. But uh, there are definite similarities between the two. And then we have this image of Don Quixote. Has, has anyone seen this one before? I showed this to uh, some of my family members. And uh, one of them said, now I've seen this one. I, I had never seen this. Has anyone seen this image? You have? This is an image of... Uh, Don Quixote, but the more I looked at that, I saw something else. What else do you notice about this image and his posture? The arms are outstretched. And have you seen anything else that has this image? It's, he's a windmill. He's a windmill. So this is Don Quixote become the windmill. He is the windmill, and he's in motion. He's in constant motion. He's swirling. He's undefined. And I looked closely at the lithograph here at the Columbia Museum of Art, and I noticed the chest area is actually images of people or stick people, which is, uh, to me, suggestive that while Dali is trying to capture the oniric or dreamlike quality of, of Don Quixote's condition, he's equating Don Quixote with the windmill. And that to me is unusual because this image of, or Don Quixote the figure, has captured the imagination of everyone across the globe and people have uh, drawn him in so many different ways. Uh, but it's interesting that it's the windmill that people tend to hook on to. So here's the, this is part one and part two. This is an English edition. Uh, uh, this is a signet classic. I think I used this in graduate school and in my teaching. So this book has about uh, 1,050 pages. And it's part one and part two. Part one was published in 1595, and part two was published in 1605, 10 years apart. So if you, if you haven't read both parts of the Quixote, then please put this on your list of things to read uh, soon. It's a fascinating tale. Uh, how many pages of this book do you think the windmill episode takes up? Again, this is the windmill that the, the globe has, has taken as its iconic image of the Quixote. And here, Dali has, uh, at least in my mind, turned Don Quixote himself into the windmill. Fewer. Fewer. One and a half pages. And it's, it's, it's not, it's in chapter eight, but I'll, uh, it's, it's essentially one page of like almost a half page because that's where the chapter starts and then maybe two-thirds of the next page. That's it. He had hundreds of adventures and they didn't end well. There was this one adventure he had with Sancho and Rocinante and he's out uh, with, uh, and he comes across this boy being whipped 
by this man. He's, oh, I have to redress this wrong. This is what I live for. I'm going to save you, Andres. I'm going to save you. Oh, thank you, Master. Thank you. What did you do? Oh, I lost the sheep. It wasn't my fault. This I'm being beaten because I lost the sheep. I'm careless. So the, what happens at the end is after Don Quixote fixes it and he goes off for his next adventure, Andres's master comes back and beats him even harder. So he hasn't redressed the wrong. He's just made it worse. And in that way, he's sort of become the, the monster that he really didn't want to become. There's another uh, episode, another short one, where there are some travelers. They're friars, religious men, and they're traveling south, and they have a princess in the coach. Oh, they're being, she's being kidnapped by these uh, ruffians. So let's go and capture, uh, or rather um, save the princess. And it turns out that she's just headed south to go meet her husband before he goes off for a job in the Indies. And so that becomes a big mess. So he is, he's not successful in redressing the wrongs, but boy, he does try. He does. So let's uh, move forward to this is my favorite slide. So take a moment to look at this. What do you see? How would you interpret this? This one is called the Atomic Age, and this was uh, 1957 like the others. He is, he's splitting, and if you look uh, closely at his head, there's a, a puppet-like figure coming out of it, out of, his, out of his brain, and it's connected to his breastplate. And what I was really struck at as I looked at this is that, so we have the windmill, the X, which is now the mushroom cloud of the atomic explosion. So Don Quixote has to create his own monsters because the, for everyone other than Quixote, he, it's just windmills. But he has to create his own horrors. So he creates the giant, like mankind, like mankind creates our own horrors, our own monsters, because the dream of reason produces monsters. So, and I, I, when I looked at the collection here, I decided late, how, how, what, how am I going to look at these illustrations in Columbia, South Carolina in 2017, having been drawn in 1957 by the famous Dali to illustrate narrative from 1595. Well, of course, I felt like that Don Quixote image with the, the swirling windmill, where, how, there's the dream, there's the monster, there's the, and I thought, well, I'm just going to take these images that I took with my uh, phone and have them be the text and bring in the ideas and try to create a narrative out of the images that are there. So sort of working backwards from what you might expect. You know, the illustrator illustrates Cervantes' text, but I wanted to take these images as texts in and of themselves. And so that's why they are arranged in this order. They're not in the same order as they are out in the gallery. But, uh, and there's also this, uh, and I haven't a slide of this, but the moth that appears in Dali's uh, lithographs denote, I believe, death. There's a, a moth that uh, has the design on its back that looks like a, a skull, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a death image, not a butterfly, but rather a, a, a moth. So, I'd like you to look closely at the heads, the figures, in this slide or in this, um, this uh, image of the, the lithograph. Do you notice anything that looks diabolical? At first I thought they were horns. I thought, 
what is that sticking out of the head? Are they, there's elf ears? I, that's what I thought. My first guess was, what, elf ears? Why did... I, probably not. <laughs> I'm probably misinterpreting that. And when I realized what it is, what I think it is, I thought, oh, wow. It's his mustache. And we're seeing him from the back. Why are we seeing him from the back? And here, uh, Dali is looking out at us from this image. Uh, I, I, I think here that this could even perhaps be a little autobiographical, maybe. Maybe some type of identification of the artist with the, uh, with the uh, image itself. And so we have both of the figures, the parallel figures, seen from behind. And so I think Dali is, is playing here with us, almost like a, like a Velasquez, uh, the ladies in waiting, the Baroque paintings where you look at it and you think, oh, I have to figure this out spatially. It's a puzzle. And so this one's a, a little bit of a puzzle. The uh, atomic monster is sort of floating off the ground. You can see a shadow there. But and in the background, the same image of La Mancha. So we still have Dali in La Mancha, but only as Dali could have portrayed Don Quixote. And this is definitely, I think, in my opinion, the jewel of these lithographs. One other figure, I think people have seen some different images peeking out of the, the mouth of the monster. What do you see here? And this is in the monster. This is why when you look at the images in the museum here, I encourage you to get really close and see what kind of Easter eggs have been hidden in here by the artist. It may be nothing, or it may be someone at the bottom of the cave or the well trying to get out into the world. Maybe another monster that's trying to get into our reality. But I see somebody sort of peeking through there. That, to me, is a really scary image. A moth? It's a moth. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a symbol, I believe, of death. And uh, it repeats. And you said that the, you saw the numbers and the watches. This reminds me just a little bit of the steampunk uh, style of uh, representing culture and reality, I guess, from the last decade. So here's another one, similar motif. And we have the windmill in motion, but then a couple of figures that are quite realistic, like you might find in a traditional illustration of uh, the Quixote. This one's called Attack the Windmill, or Attack the Mills. This is another that I spent quite a lot of time looking at. This one's worth spending some time on. It's called Don Quixote Overwhelmed. This is, uh, for me, an impotent, failed Quixote. He's losing his dream. He's being beaten by the monster. He's sitting on a, a, a trunk of a tree. Perhaps it's the oak of the Golden Age that has been cut down and is now dying. The poppy also dying, wilting. We don't see his face. But yet we do see that parallelism, that alter ego emerging from this figure in yellow. This is a, a masculine, feminine, non-gendered or double-gendered figure similar to the one seen in the Atomic Age, but uh, interestingly, holding a different uh, symbol. Can you discern what that is? It's the scales of justice, the scales of justice. And so uh, we have the scales of justice that perhaps are not being tipped in uh, Don Quixote's favor. And if you've seen other uh, Dali paintings, you'll recognize the elongated, impossible figures. And so here we have a, a good example of a uh, surrealistic image. 
I'd be interested to hear after uh, this uh, talk is over in just a, a few minutes what your interpretation is of this figure because this one I've I've thought and thought about it. I'm not quite sure yet uh, what I think about this one. The last two slides are Don and Don Quixote reading in his room. And I saved these until the end because they're the uh, ones that have some color as opposed to the, the one at the beginning that had the poppies. This one is the most uh, colorful. There is another lithograph uh, titled Madonna and Child. Uh, it didn't fit with the rest, and so I've left that out. But you will see that, and some others as well, um, the image of the wine casts, for example. But uh, this one's called Dawn, and I thought, maybe there's some hope here. And I also thought, well, maybe it's upside down, because then the red splotch could be the sun, and the, the new day is dawning, but it's not. It's not upside down. I, I checked. Uh, so this is, I was disappointed. Uh, but I did find that... This uh, image of uh, uh, maybe a graveyard was intriguing here off to the, to the right. But we've got that spiral that uh, repeats in some of the um, uh, images that we've seen that are, I could characterize them as visceral and raw. And uh, so, the um, interpretations that you've heard today are completely my own. I haven't looked in art history books or in academic journals, so they, I'm not sure I could say that they would be wrong. I guess every one who looks at art has the right to their own interpretation, so I wouldn't say that they're necessarily wrong or right but you might find that you see something else, and that to me is the beauty of the set of lithographs, is that we can take our own interpretation from it. And that's, I mean, that's what surrealism does. It, it accesses the subconscious, which is different you know, for every individual. Uh, but at the same time, we can draw a message from it. And from this one, I choose to draw hope and see an idea of the eternal in the spiral. Well, you may have seen it briefly, but it's uh, called Don Quixote Reading in His Room, and it's mostly a green, swirly, eternally infinite uh, spiral. Not so much of madness, but in this for me is more of possibility because of the green background. And green, by the way, is Cervantes' favorite color. So perhaps he chose green as a background, sort of like Lorca chose blue to uh, express his poetic aesthetic. Or maybe we, we listen to jazz and we think we can hear the color blue. And so for me, this green is Cervantes' good place. It doesn't feel visceral and raw and scary. Uh, but yet we do have uh, Don Quixote reading. Perhaps there's uh, Dulcinea, his beloved ideal. No, I can't get to it, but you'll see it out, out there, uh, looking over his shoulder and uh, dreaming, perhaps, of, of a better future or success. So thank you for coming today. And uh, I think I killed it. <laughs>